Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, virtual roundtable on the protection of civilians and the future of urban warfare. This uh, webinar is arranged on the occasion of an ongoing uh, process to get a declaration on explosive weapons in uh, populated areas, so-called EVIPA. Uh, but while that is uh, the sort of occasion, the purpose of this uh, roundtable is not activism or to talk about how important this very serious and important issue is, but a critical academic reflection for what that might be worth. Uh, hopefully also in support of this course and as a dialogue between academics and people working with this in practice. And uh, representatives of those uh, different worlds are also represented around this table. My name is Christoph Lidel. I'm a senior researcher at PRIO and I have a background in philosophy. And I'm also involved in the Norwegian Centre for Humanitarian Studies, which is a co-organiser of this. Uh, we're organising this as part of a collaboration with the Norwegian Red Cross on the topic of explosive weapons in populated areas. Uh, where we have previously had uh, a roundtable with Norwegian stakeholders. Uh, while this is kind of an academic event arranged by PRIO and it does not represent the official position of the Norwegian Red Cross or PRIO or the Norwegian Centre for Humanitarian Studies for that matter, as PRIO and NCHS does not really have a public position on such matters. In terms of the uh, structure of this meeting, um, we have a wonderful panel uh, that will start the discussion and then we have some other invited roundtable participants who will be invited into our discussion afterwards. We will open with uh, an introductory interview and then have some uh, brief comments or reflections from the panel before we have a discussion. And this is a topic that we could have spent a lot of time, many hours on discussing. But given the format of a webinar and our experience with the uh, patients of webinar audiences, we've tried to keep it as short as possible. So we're trying to limit this to about an hour. Um, and that's also reflected in a kind of ri ridiculous short uh, time frame for the introductory comments and reflections. But let's try to uh, at least uh, get the discussion going. So with us today we have an amazing panel of experts. First we have Dr. Hugo Slim who's a senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict, ELAC, at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. He specializes in the study of ethics, war and humanitarian aid, and is also leading ELAC's Red Cross funded research on the 21st century battlefield and humanitarian response, which is obviously directly related to today's topic. But he has a very multifaceted background, faceted background. From 2015 to 20, he was the head of policy and humanitarian diplomacy at the National Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva. Although he uh, was very clear that when he makes his uh, reflections today, it is not in that capacity or on behalf of the ICRC. And he has published extensively, including the books Humanitarian Ethics, A Guide to the Morality of Aid in War and Disasters, and Killing Civilians, Methods, Madness and Morality in War, which both have been important to me and my work and also are of immediate relevance for today's topic. After uh, Hugo Slim has 
uh, then been posed three impossible questions that we will soon come to. Uh, we will have a first uh, comment or reflection from Wanda Munoz, who is an international consultant on victim assistance. Uh, Wanda has a long-standing experience from working on programs and policies on issues like inclusion, including gender-based violence related issues. Uh, she's worked a lot on assistance to victims of conflict, in particular uh, of mines and or explosive remnants of war, in places like uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Chad and Colombia. And she's also been involved in issues of humanitarian disarmament, in particular with the Mine Ban Treaty and the Cluster Munition Convention. She worked with organizations like Humanity and Inclusion and UN agencies and has an education from the University of Columbia and Sciences Po Paris. Okay, so I'm doing the full round of introductions now so that we can really stick to the topic afterwards. So I'm also very proud to have with us uh, Radia Almotawakel, um, who's a human rights defender and the Yemeni co-founder of um, Watana Organization for Human Rights, which is an independent, independent organization working to defend and protect human rights in Yemen. Her recent work has focused on documenting human rights abuses by all parties to the current conflict in Yemen, including by the United States, the Saudi-led coalition and the Houthi forces. Sorry. Uh, she has briefed uh, the UN Security Council on the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, written widely and appeared in a range of media outlets. And she was even named one of Time magazine's 100 most influential people of 2019. Then Abigail Watson uh, will also giving a reflection based on her uh, work with uh, currently Safer World and previously Oxford Research Group on issues uh, relating to the uh, to military interventions in the Middle East, Horn of Africa and Sahel and elsewhere. She's co-authored uh, six major reports. She's been uh, doing uh, a podcast series, many blogs, policy briefings and book chapters. And she's also an associate of the Conflict Research Center at the University, University of Kent. And finally, Nicholas March, my dear colleague and the senior researcher at PRIO, who is researching topics like global trade in small arms and light weapons, relationships between arms, governance and violence, armed trafficking, arms acquisition by non-state parties in civil war, and arms export and transfer controls. And he's done extensive work on these issues, amongst other things, as a key person in the Norwegian Initiative on Small Arms Transfers, NISAT, which is a coalition of PRIO, the Norwegian Red Cross, and Norwegian Church Aid. Okay, so now let's turn to the uh, conversation uh, with Hugo Slim. So, Dr. Hugo Slim, do you mind turning on your camera? There you are. Thanks so much for joining. Um, firstly, before we go into these impo three impossible questions, I wonder if you could just say a little about what we mean by urban warfare. What are the different types of urban warfare that are on the, our table? Christopher, thank you. I think it's important to start with you know, unpacking urban warfare, because we mustn't talk about it as a single thing. There's a whole spectrum of sort of military activities that constitute urban warfare. So, you know, at one end of the spectrum, we're talking about quite quick uh, raids into a city to extract someone or suppress a particular threat or force. We're talking about small explosions by armed groups that are, you know, suicide bombs and things. Then we're talking um, much more about deep penetrating attacks into part of a city to uh, suppress or um, win an area in an area attack, not a whole city attack. Um, 
We're also talking about coercive control over cities sometimes to keep a population under control. And of course, that takes us towards occupation as well. And then, of course, finally, we're talking about a sort of whole city military attack to take and hold and conquer a city. So, you know, if we're talking about an area attack on a city, we might be thinking of the Battle of Mawari um, in the Philippines. If we're talking about taking a whole city, we would probably be talking about battles like Fallujah, um, Mosul. Um, we could talk about Aleppo, but that was really the final battle was about half of the city um, or a third of the city. So I think it's important to break it down. Um, and I also think it's important to recognize today that attacks on cities and defending cities can be done kinetically with force and explosive weapons and physical attack and through cyber weapons, of course, where cities can often be vulnerable to cyber attack. Exactly. So we're talking about a wide phenomenon here. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are currently uh, dramatic developments in military technology. There are general trends of uh, armed conflict that are relevant to thinking about the future. Uh, firstly, you know, part of the reason why I thought it would be interesting to think about the future is that when we currently discuss issues of protection of civilians uh, from urban warfare, we will think of situations like the uh, civil war in Syria, the current situation in Yemen, etc. And I'm sure that these are situations that we also really need to uh, think of in terms of the future. But there might be other, other developments that should be included in our thoughts on how to deal with the protection of civilians in the context of urban warfare. So could you say a little about, just share some initial thoughts on how current trends of armed conflict hurt, how current developments of military technology might impact on this in the future? Yes, so I think, you know, the first point to make is that urban warfare is here to stay because we are an urbanizing world. So more and more people are living in cities and towns and um, cities and towns are always, you know, focuses of power so they will be highly contested always so urban warfare is here to stay in the future of warfare um at the moment if we look at militarily we're seeing you know it's a, it's a terrible thing to say in front of radio and others in yemen and syria but 21st century wars so far have largely been militarily small wars and they've often been very asymmetric wars so we talked about fallujah and aleppo and um, Marawi and other things, we're looking at asymmetric urban warfare, where one side tends to have air support, air power, um, higher weapons, sometimes precision computerized weapons, and the other has a much more limited range of small arms, small weapons, RPGs, etc. That's characterized current war, and it may well go on characterizing other wars in the future. But the big challenge today is peer-to-peer -to -peer war and the arrival of big war again or the return to big war and if we have big war with really similarly powered and capable large-scale military forces then we can expect very different urban battles i think in the future and and i'm afraid i think we can expect cities to be much more prone to um total fights for a whole city not just parts of the city and uh, high levels of destruction um, in terms of technology, we can also think of multi-domain warfare. So at the moment, you know, a lot of cities are literal cities on the coasts of seas or rivers. And we've seen largely, you know, a combinations of air, land and um, naval power. That's going to spread out and we're going to be seeing multi-domain operations where, you know, people are working in cyberspace, information space, um, much more digitally and computerized warfare throughout cities. And one huge area that we can expect in the cities, and people in, in places like Gaza already know this, um, is the huge expansion and intensification of surveillance. We're going to see forces who can have extraordinary levels of surveillance into houses, around houses, whatever, from all sorts of new technology that's coming at us now. So a huge rise in urban surveillance or surveillance of urban space, 
and a huge rise in computerized warfare. So we will see more autonomous weapons, more artificial intelligence driven weaponry operating in the cities. And it was interesting last week that you know Microsoft won the US military contract to put headsets on all 120,000 you know, frontline combat US troops. And that's going to increase augmented reality, um, the ability to see round corners, to see what's beyond you. So, you know, for some forces, the notion of indirect fire will increasingly diminish because much fire will be direct because of computerized warfare. Even if you can't see what you're firing at with your eyes, you can see it in augmented reality. So we're looking at a whole new approach to urban space through surveillance, augmented weapons and things. I think the other huge you know, issue around that, of course, is the cities will become increasingly complicated, increasingly big, increasingly densely populated. And a lot of them will have this extraordinary imbalance between some areas having extraordinarily sophisticated public services, electrification, energy, you know, smart city elements, and a huge fringe and apron around those cities that are very poor and very different. So urban space itself will be bigger, denser, and varied as well. Thanks. Um, so talking about the future is of that's that's why I, I said these are impossible questions because we're trying to look into the future. Things can come up that were completely unexpected. And uh, and still these trends that you describe, I think they're already partly kind of tendencies that that are there today and that it's really important to be aware of. Uh, another part of this equation is adherence to international humanitarian law or the laws of armed conflicts and also the standing of this principle of the protection of civilians. And you know we can talk about this in terms of prediction but we can also just uh, think in terms of future scenarios, you know, where are we heading? What are the different kind of potential futures uh, in terms of the standing of international humanitarian law in this connection? Could you just share a few first thoughts on this? Yes, yeah, so I think, you know, as everyone always says, we have the basic principles in IHL, which give us a very firm base in terms of proportionality, distinction, um, you know, and, and the basic principle of protection of civilians as well. So I think we'll get some help in respecting IHL from the increasing development of precision weapons. So I think precision weapons will make a contribution to greater respect for IHL in certain situations, as we've seen recently. But um, not everyone will be using precision weapons and not everyone will want to be precise. And we've seen that even, you know, with, with Russian and Syrian bombing and bombing um, by the coalition in Yemen. There's still a lot of unguided, uh, indiscriminate fire as well. And I think we can expect that to continue deliberately or, you know, inevitably um, by different forces. So sometimes precision will help and let's hope it helps more and more. I think again, it'll also go back to that point of scale. Um, you know, what will large scale combat operations, as the Americans call it, big war, what will that really mean for IHL in cities? And I think, um, you know, in big fights, a lot of explosive weapons will be used. I mean, I think that you can look at battles today, you can look at, you know, asymmetric battles like Fallujah or Marawi. And still forces who would try and reduce harm and were working very much to try and stick to IHL needed to use explosive weapons because of the threats set against them. So the Filipino forces had to um, take house by house areas of Marawi. And to do that, they had to blow up those buildings, essentially, to blow up the booby traps inside each room, um, because otherwise they couldn't take possession of those of those buildings or whatever. So sometimes, you know, you're, you're not going to avoid explosive weapons and it would be wrong to do so if you're trying to win a war. So I think that makes one of the most important things we can do is focus more on civilian evacuation. In certain urban contexts, I'm afraid in the future, we're going to have to 
really get good at civilian evacuation. And, you know, where it's worked in Marawi or in Aleppo, at the end of the day in Aleppo and at the beginning, but also around Fallujah where people evacuated themselves, in a funny way, that's probably going to be the safest way to protect civilians in urban warfare by in evacuation in future. The other thing I think that lawyers and policymakers are going to have to do is develop new policies that interpret IHL around this fast moving technology of surveillance, around patterns of siege that we've seen so much of lately. And, you know, as you know, 40 areas were un have been under siege in the 10 years of the Syrian conflict. Um, and of course, around protection of basic services, because there's going to be so much dual use cyber and computerized technology in these cities and with these warring parties that we're going to have to really establish clear policy rules on um, protecting civilian objects and services on which civilians depend for their survival. So I think those are the challenges. And, and um, IHL has its work cut out. It's got a lot to go on that it has already, and it's going to have to interpret new technology, new forms of urban warfare. Thank you. So my last question was about exactly this question of what the implications are for for the regulation of explosive weapons in populated areas in the future. But I think you actually already covered that very well. Do you have any last issue to? Uh, well, my my view my view would just be five five simple things. If I was to focus on five things, it would be you know to try and reduce urban warfare and big explosive weapons based. I don't think you're going to avoid it. You've got to reduce it where you can. The second thing I was really focused on proportionality because if if you can fight proportionally, you'll also reduce large scale destruction. Environmental protection must be key. You know, cities and blowing up cities and damaging cities, particularly if they're near rivers and seas, has major environmental protection issues. That's got to be foregrounded. Evacuation, which I've meant it, mentioned, may have to become a real humanitarian art. And cultural property. You know, so many cities are full of cultural property that that has to be foregrounded too. So those five things. OK, thanks so much. And you'll be with us for the discussion. But now I'll turn to Wanda Munoz for uh, an opening reflection or comments as seen from your uh, background and your uh, perspective on this. So please. Thank you very much, Christopher, and thank you for inviting me to this um, exciting roundtable. I will share my thoughts on two topics, the impact of explosive weapons in populated areas, and I will touch uh, very quickly on lethal autonomous weapon systems that you also uh, asked me to comment about. So I will start with explosive weapons. The consequences of the use of these weapons in populated areas have been widely documented and they cause a pattern of harm that has um, been uh, developed in different publications. It is important for us to note that this harm takes place whether the use of such weapons is deemed lawful or unlawful and irrespective of the user. Thinking not only about the present but also about the, the future, no, which is the topic of our roundtable, we have to acknowledge the increasing scale of urbanization. The trends of population density keep increasing yearly, so the matter becomes uh, even more urgent. Particularly problematic are explosive weapons with wide area effects, which are those that have a large destructive radius, inaccurate delivery systems, and are designed to deliver multiple munitions over a wide area, or a combination of any of these three characteristics. The destruction of uh, Marawi, like Hugo mentioned, uh, of 80% of housing in Mosul, of water irrigation systems in Raqqa, of Kodaida's port in Yemen, and many other examples show once and again that um, the use of these weapons in, affected, in populated areas affect thousands of people many years after the attack, not only because of the tremendous impact in, um, the, in, of death and injury, but also because of the reverberating effects. This includes, for instance, water and waste management systems that are damaged or destroyed. The same for food production facilities and many others that have a wider impact on access to health, 
including vaccination and sexual and reproductive health services that we often don't hear much about, education, livelihoods, uh, supply networks, uh, which causes uh, in its turn displacement and also divert towards reconstruction, scarce national and international resources that could have been used otherwise. Humanitarian access and victim assistance, as you imagine, are extremely challenging in this context. So we need to think about comprehensive responses to address the impact in survivors and the families of those killed and injured, but also to respond to these massive reverberating effects. Uh, a few words about gender. I want to mention first that a gender analysis should examine not just how explosive weapons affect women and girls, but how gender norms affect their participation in political processes where decisions are being taken. For instance, on when these weapons should be considered acceptable, on what victim assistance entails and what the priorities for reconstruction are, and of course in peacemaking processes. We could also discuss about how gender norms negatively affect men, but for the moment I'll just mention some examples of the impact in women. Uh, that have been documented by survivors, other organizations, and we have seen in our experience. For example, female survivors uh, of explosive weapons tend to suffer greater stigma as a result of injury, disfigurement or disability. They are often abandoned by, by their partners to take care of their families alone when they need the most support. And the gravity of the situation is compounded because in most countries, women still have less access to economic opportunities than men. In addition, studies by UNFPA demonstrate that women who acquire, acquire an impairment are 10 times, 10 times more likely to be victims of sexual violence. And I could go on on human trafficking, child marriage, uh, sexual harassment, etc. So we need to think about, uh, think about and plan and implement uh, policies that recognize and respond to all these challenges and with a solid gender approach that still today has really, really a lot of uh, room for improvement. Uh, so when we look at the scope of these challenges, the need for the political and practical responses, such as the declaration um, that is uh, going on on this topic, are uh, fundamental, are vital, and are of most urgency. So let me take one minute on lethal autonomous weapon systems, defining them as those that would select and engage targets without meaningful, meaningful human control which is the conceptual approach that has attracted the most uh, interest in international discussions, according to Junidir. I want to make it clear that our concern is not about absolutely all use of AI in the military, no? but specifically in what the ICRC has called critical functions, those of selection and engagement of targets. These weapons are unacceptable for ethical, legal and operational reasons, and if they were used, in the end, it could come down to risking that civilians could be uh, attacked um, but as a result of actions determined by, an, by a machine that, of course, lacks human capacity to analyze cultural context, to identify all possible alternatives and to understand what it means to take a human life. All these are ethical and moral concerns that no matter how much machine learning advances and other technologies, will not be resolved technically. Um, and this is uh, backed by uh, many renowned artificial intelligence scholars and experts. Um, AI is already being used, and this will certainly be the case more frequently in the future. But those of us who are interested in the protection of civilians should really engage in these dialogues to draw a moral, politically, and in my view, hopefully a legal line of what is acceptable. Uh, so, I, so I truly hope that the international discussions in Geneva that has been suspended can restart as soon as possible. And just one last thought, Christopher. Uh, you mentioned that this, is, this meeting is not about activism, but that is a, a part of me. So I really want to say that, that we need to be realistic of what the uh, future or warfare may bring. But we also re need to realize that these things are not inevitable because conflict, explosive weapons, autonomous weapons and their rules are created by humankind and as such they can and indeed should evolve and we should make an effort to influence them when we don't agree. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, Wanda and uh, and uh, also for bringing in the, the issue of uh, the position of women in this picture and also recently there has been um, more focus on the impact on children and this is also a part that, um, for instance, the Save the Children has uh, brought up and done mm -hmm. some analysis in collaboration with the Peace Research Institute, also. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even if 
uh, today's children will of course grow up in the future, there will be many more, so this is also an uh, issue to think of. Uh, on uh, With that bad joke, I'll uh, move from uh, Mexico to Yemen and to uh, Radia al Mutawakel. Um, thanks so much again for being with us and uh, please uh, share your opening reflections. Thank you again for having me. Uh, so maybe you know Yemen now, it's known as the worst humanitarian crisis and we all know it's a man-made crisis. So in Yemen, the, uh, the most uh, um, backwards uh, weapons have been used and the most advanced, advanced weapons have been used by states and by armed groups. And as a result, uh, all sides, all kinds of weapons are doing the same. I mean, uh, uh, huge harm in civilians. So, uh, so in, in Yemen, it was, it was like um, the airstrikes, uh, the ground shilling, uh, the landmines, uh, by the armed groups and by the states um, uh, equally. And it's, it's beside of the, all effects that is related to the destroying the very limited infrastructure, including schools and hospitals, and the death of in, and injury of civilians, and most of them are women and children, and the trauma that is uh, in the cities especially. Uh, and uh, uh, all the effects you know uh, about these weapons. Also, we have the starvation in Yemen. So we keep saying that Yemenis are not starving, they are being starved because the attitude of parties to the conflict led to the starvation and, and especially the, uh, the, the weapons, the ex explosive weapons, like uh, there was uh, a strike by the Saudi Emirati led coalition that hit farms, water points, fishermen, and also Houthis, they laid uh, landmines uh, in the way of also farms and water and food sources. So we are trying in Muatana, for example, to, to document starvation. It's very complicated because in the international humanitarian law, it says that you have to prove the tension. So we have to do like the pattern of the violations or the pattern of uh, these kinds of incidents to prove that led to starvation. This is one complication. So it's very easy to, to push people to starvation, but it's not easy to prove it. Um, and from our experience, in most of the incidents, whether by the, the airstrikes or the ground chilling, whether by armed groups of states like Saudis and Emiratis and their allies, uh, in most of the incidents uh, we have documented where civilians were killed and injured, there was no even a military advantage. There was no military target around the incident and many of the survivors and their families they keep asking why we have been targeted so it's a very preventable uh, violations among many years and uh, so it's not about improving the weapons themselves it's not about instruction it's about accountability so from our experience parties to the conflict they don't care they they just don't care and it's and we in Muatana we have documented we have published a lot of reports we did a lot of advocacy work and then we discovered that this is not enough the whole world is already knowing what's happening in Yemen and it is documented very well uh, but nothing has been changed because there is no accountability and whenever we talk about the warfare I hope that we talk about accountability and I I mean criminal accountability I mean that those who committed those war crimes or horrible violations, there should be mechanisms to hold them accountable. They should go to prison. If they know that the we will, they will held, um, uh, be held accountable, the, the Yemen will not be the worst humanitarian crisis, even among the war. But they trust impunity more than anything else. And I feel very sad when we talk about the warfare and weapons as a destiny that we have to go through. And we do not talk about accountability with the same trust, and we don't have to set, to have the same ground when it comes to, to accountability. I will tell you something, for example, now, because the US administ new administration has a, a new approach, 
since the last two months, there is very hot, um, fr uh, I mean, front lines in Yemen, and the war is still going on. But the, the effect on civilians by the airstrikes is much less in a very uh, significant way. It's just because the, the, the new approach of the, the US, the new uh, US administration have a new approach. So it is, it's good in one hand that civilians are less uh, as victims, but it's very sad at the other hand because they could do it. So they can do it if they want to do it. It's not because they, not, they don't know how to do it or they need more trainings or more instructions. It's just because they don't care. And we cannot be like uh, tied with the political norms, how it is going to be changed. Accountability is something for life. And it, accountability mechanisms are very, very limited. We have this great international humanitarian law, but we don't have the mechanisms in order to implement it and to make it strong. So for Yemen, for example, none of the states or parties to the conflict has signed Rome status and it is very difficult in the Security Council to refer the Yemen situation to the ICC and it was a huge battle to have any kind of international investigation in Yemen. We succeed but it is investigation, it's not a mechanism for criminal accountability. Uh, this is something those people because Hogo he mentioned five things regarding to reduce the civilian harm, the um, the, five, the five things he mentioned, it will only be achieved by accountability, not by changing the weapons, not by doing more restrictions, not by evacuating uh, civilians. I don't want to leave my home. And I'm sure that they don't need to hit my home if they, if they, if they care. And it's, not, um, it's a very long way to make them care, but it should be there. And it will change a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, while focusing now on the current situation, you showed how that can really be a very important lesson for the future and uh, how maybe we need to really try to pinpoint the source of accountability in addition to thinking about trends in military technology and so on. And I, I really take this as a challenge also for our discussion to think about, OK, so what does that call for accountability mean for thinking about the future of protection of civilians in urban warfare? So thank you very much. We'll now um, turn to Abigail Watson, uh, who's um, focused uh, a lot on issues including remote warfare, and that's the topic that I wanted you to talk a bit about, partly in the context of uh, NATO and kind of advanced militaries. Thank you. So please, Abigail. <laughs> uh, thank you, and, and thank you for having me, and thank you for the comments so far. I've been furiously nodding at what everybody's been saying. I'd like to spend a, a few minutes just critically analysing some of the unhelpful debates around the risks of contemporary conflict, particularly when it comes to remote warfare in urban environments. So, as, as already mentioned, I come at these issues from years of analysing remote warfare. So that refers to the approach by which states like the UK, the US and other NATO members support local and regional forces to do the bulk of frontline fighting through things like intelligence sharing, air support, training, instead of deploying large numbers of their own forces. So we've seen this approach over the last decade in places like the Horn of Africa, West Africa and the Middle East and including urban environments like Mosul, which was already mentioned. And it looks likely con to continue. Um, we've already seen that some NATO members have been adopting a similar approach to remote warfare when it comes to deciding how they will reshift their fo forces in, in, as Hugo called it, the big wars, when we think about state-based threats from, from Russia and other states. Um, in the UK and the US, they've adopted an approach called persistent engagement, which looks very much like remote warfare and has many of these same um, sort of tenets of, of the approach. Um, and one of 
the big things around remote warfare and one of the reasons that it's used so much is because as Thomas Waldman recently noted when talking about vicarious warfare, it provides the illusion of war on the cheap. It doesn't involve a lot of a force, a, a, na a nation's own forces being on the ground. It doesn't provoke public and parliamentary backlash, often because there's a lot of secrecy around the types of deployments or because it's not classed as combat deployment. And so risk averse policymakers often reach for this approach as a way to involve to be involved abroad with minimal costs. This has huge implications for how we think about the future of conflict, because this illusion has never squared with the reality on the ground in recent campaigns. As Radia already noted in the case of Yemen, while forces of intervening states may be less at risk because of technology. Civilians have seen the devastating con consequences of contemporary conflicts. And this is especially true in more urban environments, as recent campaigns against ISIS in Iraq and Syria have already shown, while providing training, equipment and air support to local forces in the fight against ISIS has meant that Western forces put very few soldiers on the front lines, civilian and local partners on the ground suffered significantly. A recent World Economic Forum estimate, estimated that the cost of reconstruction will amount to 100 billion for Iraq and at least 200 billion for Syria, which doesn't include the cost incurred by neighboring countries suffering from spillover effects or the human cost of hundreds of thousands of people being displaced or killed. It's worrying then that there's not been a proper discussion of what the true risks of remote warfare in urban environments are. There's been some, some positive movements, but the quality of debate, debate within NATO member states has been quite poor. For instance, in the UK, which is where the which has been the focus of my research. The UK government still claims that while it's killed or injured 4,000 ISIS fighters in airstrikes, it only acknowledges to killing one civilian. This policy line has been roundly criticised by a number of NGOs. For instance, Air Wars said that it stretches credulity and in off the record interviews with officials who were part of the anti-ISIS coalition, one source told my team at the Oxford Research Group that this claim is absolutely nonsense. Um, and this, this level of poor debate is important. As Hugo notes, urban warfare is here to stay. So it's essential that we learn the right lessons from recent campaigns. Discussions about technology sometimes seem to indicate that technology can get us around the complexity of conflict. But recent urban campaigns indicate that we should be really careful and maybe just reject that narrative. And more importantly, a lack of debate perpetuates a myth that intense urban war fighting can be fought with minimal casualties, a myth that will become even more problematic as the world becomes more urbanised. Therefore, I agree with, with Wanda and other comments that were made about there needs to be an honest and inclusive debate about the real risks of contemporary challenges and whether and what approaches should be used in the future. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And lastly, we have uh, Nick Marsh, uh, who um, has been invited to sort of fill in or fill out, complement uh, Abby's um, uh, focus on remote warfare and more advanced warfare uh, by thinking of other actors and other types of uh, weapons use. Please. Yeah, thanks very much, Christopher. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I'd like to start off just with the sort of observation that almost all wars being fought today um, are wholly or partly civil wars. Uh, which are taking place in developing countries. Um, 
and key actors in those wars, as uh, you know, other people have mentioned, uh, are non-state actors, um, rebel groups, if you like, or, or we can give them other names, um, and also the armed forces of developing countries. Um, so in terms of the, the questions uh, you asked um, Hugo earlier, um, in terms of trends, um, I mean, firstly, as, as Radia said, there, there's a huge variety. Um, we can look at Saudi Arabia, uh, as mentioned in Yemen, using you know very high tech, very advanced weapon systems. Um, other countries like Russia also, um, uh, you know, using advanced weapon systems. But I'd like to, if you like, balance uh, a lot of the talk about high technology, um, because in general, uh, when we're looking at non-state actors um, or when we're looking at developing country armed forces, very frequently they use technology that's been around for 50, 60 years um, or, or longer. Um, you know, the Kalashnikov is still the most common weapon to be seen um, in a civil war battlefield. Um, and certainly there are some exceptions, such as the use of dr drones by non-state groups in Syria um, or Yemen, for example. But And these got a lot of attention, um, a lot of media coverage, but they got that attention because they're exceptional, because they're something um, way out of the normal. Um, uh, so when we're looking at the um, future prospects, um, I mean, firstly, there, there's a major challenge. Um, how do you get non-state groups to observe uh, IHL? Um, you know, they're not state parties to, to any uh, international treaty. Um, uh, there have, of course, been some efforts to get non-state groups to, to voluntarily try to follow some aspects of IHL. Um, but, uh, you know, this is... Um, uh, th this is very challenging, um, especially, uh, you know, in, in some contemporary wars, you may have a very large number of non-state groups fighting. Uh, they may not be around for very long. They may merge, split up. Um, it, it can be a very complex environment. So so getting the, the observation of IHL sort of principles um, can be very difficult. Um, and secondly, Concerning the the prol proliferation of sort of the advanced technology um, people have been mentioning, um, it's usually uh, the most higher technology is expensive um, and it needs an infrastructure around it. Um, and th those are the main reasons why you don't see it being used so much um, in, in many civil wars. Um, so in terms of the future, uh, a key thing I think will be um, whether uh, the technology can be made to work without too, so much infrastructure. I mean, a satellite phone being an example of something that does work. You, you can take it anywhere as long as you can charge the batteries. You, you don't need much infrastructure, at least uh, on the planet. You're, obviously, you need the satellites um, in space. Um, or, or whether the users of those weapons can develop the infrastructure. Um, and certainly in Syria, we saw quite... Um, extensive use of uh you know technology for manufacturing weapons etc um uh so then the last question um uh and sort of what's imply for the regulation um i, I i'd like to very much just echo what abby and radia have said um the the parties who are fighting they pretty much all of them receive large amounts of external support, whether it's Saudi Arabia being supported by the UK, US, Italy, among others, um, non-state groups in Syria, likewise receiving you know billions of dollars worth of external support. Um, we're looking at donations of arms, equipment, donations of training, provision of services, as Abby was mentioning. Um, so to, to a great extent, uh, the parties that are fighting, the parties that are committing IHL violations depend upon external support. Um, uh, and, the, you know, as in the Cold War, there's extensive use of surrogates, proxies, um, you know, you know, by the, the P5 members of the, the Security Council. Um, but uh, that dependence on external support um, 
is a form of leverage. Um, uh, as Radu was mentioning, um, the US is able to to change how, how Saudi Arabia uh, behaves uh, by using that leverage by withdrawing certain amounts of support. Um, so, I mean, I, I think if we're looking at trying to prevent um, IHL violations using explosive weapons in, in, in urban settings, we need to be looking at not just what, what are your armed forces doing, um, but asking, okay, who are you supporting? Um, what are your surrogates? What are your proxies? What are your allies doing as well? Uh, and can you use your leverage to prevent them uh, committing violations? Okay, thanks very much. Wonderful. Thanks, Nick. I thought this was already incredibly uh, interesting and, uh, and informative. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, those who would um, uh, be comfortable with it to turn on their uh, videos and uh, to have a little uh, exchange and also uh, for participants in this uh, little roundtable to raise their hand if they have a question or comment. Please stick to just one uh, one question or comment at a time, and I'll I think I'll open up uh, to take a few before uh, going back to the panel. Uh, with us we have uh, some uh, uh, representatives from. Um, in addition to Prio, we have Christian Mikkelsen Institute, we have the Norwegian Institute of Foreign Affairs, uh, International Affairs, NUPI. We have uh, the University of Oslo with the Center for Human Rights, uh, Norwegian Red Cross, uh, amongst others, ICRC. But these are just the select few who were admitted to this roundtable. So uh, uh, afterwards, I'm hoping that this discussion will also carry on amongst the eventual viewers of it. Uh, I have uh, Rasmus uh, Veske from Norwegian People's Aid uh, first on my list and others are welcome to raise their hands while he's talking. Thank you very much, Christopher, and um, thanks a lot to all the speakers um, so far. It's been very interesting. So uh, yeah, thanks for uh, allowing us to comment a bit. And I was thinking uh, of focusing my uh, quick intervention here on uh, the political declaration. It was uh, mentioned in the introduction that um, this is partly why we're, we're having this meeting because um, yeah, there is this effort to address the humanitarian concerns deriving from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas and particularly those with wide area impacts. And I think that's the, uh, the first comment I wanted to make just on um, the declaration wanting to um, set or to, to establish a principle of avoidance. At least that's what, uh, what uh, the civil society is calling for, avoiding the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects. And uh, it's very important to, to distinguish between that and, and all explosive weapons. We do also acknowledge that uh, uh, it's very hard to ban explosive weapons. Um, and that uh, was never the, the purpose either of this political declaration process. It is uh, the, the purpose was uh, enhancing or improving protection of civilians. Uh, and one way of doing that would be to avoid those weapons having a particularly wide area impact. As, as we heard from Wanda explaining very well, what, what does wide impact, uh, uh, wide area impact mean? And um, I think the declaration process is sort of an acknowledgement of uh, the need to constantly improve protection of civilians uh, by not merely pointing to uh, IHL and saying, OK, we have this framework of IHL, uh, but constantly looking at ways uh, in which we can, uh, yeah, get better and better and uh, and i would like to remind us all that uh, ihl is is uh, not um, the highest uh, possible standards we could ever hope to achieve when it comes to protecting civilians it's always possible to do more than the minimum requirements which are uh, merely minimum requirements so uh, agreeing to an avoidance principle would not only help protect civilians but it in many ways would also uh, help comply with existing ihl the principles of IHL were mentioned and uh, uh, the, the application and even interpretation of IHL has been questioned by many, including the ICRC in this process. Uh, are states even fully compliant with IHL when they use area weapons in populated areas? 
given that the, the likelihood of, uh, of hitting civilian targets and, and, and causing extensive civilian damage is very, very high. And this has been uh, documented widely over the, over the last 10 years at least. So uh, I guess uh, I'll leave it with that uh, comment on the, on the political declaration. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, as you have uh, made me aware, a key question these days in terms of this declaration is whether one should uh, go for a, a general principle of avoidance of uses of explosive weapons with wide area effects. So avoidance or rather uh, the uh, strict limitation or reduction to a you know, minimum. And and uh, and uh, avoidance would be in line with also working for a ban, while the constraints, uh, restraints on this use, would still open a window for kind of uses when it's uh, proportionate or necess necessary, right? So so this this would be uh, this this would be the uh, the question of. How to how to formulate this in the declaration? So I saw Rasmus, you disagreed with my uh, uh, my explanation of what restraint would involve as dif distinguished from avoidance. Maybe you could just, in the absence of other hands around the table, Rasmus, you could maybe just uh, comment on that, please. Yeah, this is the advantage of the camera, right? You could uh, probably see that I, I didn't quite disagree to um, an avoidance principle calling for a ban or even uh, being one. Uh, and I think Ireland, who is uh, leading this declaration process, being the, the pen holder and coordinating this process, has been very clear that this is not about banning explosive weapons. And even the ICRC has made this explicit in many uh, by, like, by helping uh, uh, states understand IHL and also this process. What is this about? It's not about banning a weapon. It's about, and it, it's even said by many that um, an avoidance principle would not entail a ban. It would actually, uh, uh, yeah, still open up in some circumstances uh, of using area weapons. But the principle of avoiding them would, uh, in, in most cases, uh, um, be a very practical way to avoid uh, civilian harm and also to respect the, the, the principles uh, of IHL. So this is a very important, uh, I mean, which word is, is chosen in the end in the declaration? None of the words on the table do imply a, a ban or, uh, uh, yeah, that's why that's why it doesn't say uh, a ban and it's also very important to to highlight that this is a political uh, document with uh, some political um, sort of uh, commitments and thereby it is not a legal document so so some states have been concerned that this is altering IHL uh, and that uh, we should protect what we already have uh, whereas uh, many civil society voices also taking the information that they, they, they bring to this table from field work. So it's I would be careful in calling civil society work activism in all cases. It's very well documented work from uh, uh, war zones uh, uh, where yeah this has he's been has been documented very very thoroughly. So um, yeah, I hope that's uh, <laughs> that. Uh, 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 goes uh, in some way in answering that that uh, that question. Thanks. I'll leave it to others as well. Sorry, uh, Wanda, uh, you have your hand raised. Let's let's uh, thanks thanks a lot for that clarification, uh, Erasmus. Uh, let's. Uh, Keep to the to the question of uh, of the future. So also, if if we think of this discussion on uh, avoidance or ban, etc., uh, it also relates to the question of what would be realistic and what the future kind of prospects of such a declaration would be. So with that in mind, I, I give you the word, Wanda. Thank you, Christopher. Did you make an, an, inter an interesting point, and I think one of the issues that we could discuss for, for hours and hours is what, what does it mean to be realistic, no? and realistic from the point of view of whom? 
because you may say no it's not realistic that that at some point there will be a stop in the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects in populated areas and there are others that would say no that is realistic that is what should be realistic so i just to question this idea of what what it is to be realistic but i want to tie quickly uh, rasmus comments with um a comment that Hugo made earlier, that evacuation may be the safest way to protect civilians, because I, I respectfully disagree. Like, as Raya mentioned, I think first and foremost, we need to consider the views of affected people who certainly don't want to leave their homes for an uncertain future and face all the challenges of displacement. Um, I recognize that evacuation may be part of the response in specific cases, but I think we need to do better than that. No, it needs to be said that the best, the safest way to protect civilians is to avoid the use of explosive weapons in in populated areas, and and the declaration could still, I think, be strengthened in 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 this regard. And as Rasmus mentioned, the flexibility of a declaration as a political commitment is that it's not a, a ban treaty, and therefore we can be a more ambitious and more more flexible flexible and really put this clear vision forward. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So when we uh, say realistic, you know, it's probably our best attempt at thinking of uh, what is likely. And of course, that opens for kind of a, a spectrum from what we would like to see to what really we think to our best judgment will probably be the possibility. And this is an extremely relevant question when thinking about the future. So, so thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Abigail? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly jump in and agree with what Wanda said. And I also think it, it comes to what she was saying about who is involved in that conversation around what is realistic and what is the necessary course of action. For instance, she she already noted and it 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 resonates with some of the work of carol crone as well on on the gender biases that shape what is re seen as realistic versus the i mean she she makes the point that we um overestimate the utility of hard security solutions and underestimate the utility of so-called softer approaches and i think that's an important thing to consider when we think about what is realistic Thanks a lot. Uh, and we have uh, Hendrik Sisa. Please introduce yourself uh, in, in two words before you take the word. Philosopher, Oslo. That's two words. <laughs> and colleague of uh, Christopher, uh, great to be part of this seminar. Thank you for insightful observations and uh, worrisome uh, observations as well. Just a very quick comment and possibly question uh, from me in case anyone wants to uh, comment on it. Uh, it was mentioned by some of you that the development of cyber weapons obviously applies to different forms of urban warfare and that the more these sorts of weapons become AI based, and that's of course true of kinetic weapons as well, I mean explosives, uh, based on, on AI systems. Uh, and these become easier to program and make and cheaper. Uh, much of the future of urban warfare could consist in such. Uh, obviously, there will also be aspects of protection uh, that could be linked to uh, digitalized surveillance systems, for instance, better information on where things are, where people are, what is happening. So that's the positive side of the coin. But uh, even though this was mentioned and I found the uh, comments insightful, uh, if anyone would want to comment a little bit more on that, what sort of face of urban warfare we could see, for instance, through uh, cyber attacks of various kinds that could put hospitals out of work, that could uh, you know, go, go into power grids and, and so on. Um, so if anyone would like to comment on it, it would be great. Either way, as a comment, this is obviously part of the future of urban warfare. Thanks again for organizing, Christopher and everyone. And thank you, Henrik. And uh, amongst many things, you're the editor of the Journal of Military Ethics, which is obviously of immediate uh, relevance for this uh, meeting. Um, any uh, comments or um, reflections on this from around the floor? Nick? Um, yeah, just uh, 
a, a quick follow up on what Henrik was saying about cyber warfare. I mean, one very difficult thing about cyber attacks is it can be very difficult to know who perpetrated the attack. Um, you know, if a soldier fires uh, or, or a uniformed soldier fires a, fires a gun, you know who did it and you can look up the chain of command. Um, what we've seen, uh, for example, in Ukraine um, with a sort of limited use of cyber attacks is often they're carried out by groups which may be associated with a state but not a but are not part of that state um it's very easy to to have sort of plausible denial of deniability um so then in in terms of uh you know, declaration um or, or ihl uh, it then becomes relatively easy to pretend or or you know, put up a pretense that you are following your responsibilities uh, so, just so long as the people who are perpetrating the attack don't, uh, you know, aren't so easy to identify. Hmm. Yeah. You go, please. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to respond to a few comments. I, I really enjoyed listening to everybody. So thank you. Um, the first point, you know, Rasmus is you know, rightful raising of the avoid strategy and the avoid campaigning policy as well. I, I'm in two minds about it. I, I'm not sure you'll get the right states signing up to avoid. I think particularly if they're now, as many of them are, positioning towards peer-to-peer -to -peer war, <clears throat> they're going to find it rather strange to be signing a declaration saying they'll avoid. So I think it's it's got political problems as a political document, but maybe you and the Irish are brilliant. I mean, the Irish are brilliant. Then maybe they'll they'll find a way to get a bit of paper. But if you are going to seriously talk about a void, you must in the next breath talk about alternatives. And I, you know, you can't say in a sense you've got two possible alternatives. One is to just everybody invent, invent, invent more precision weapons. So everyone's got one and we're all using precision weapons. The second one is to say, yeah, well, just kill more soldiers. You know, just put your soldiers in the in the in the line of fire and explosive weapons. March up to buildings. Don't fire at them from a distance. So you've got you've got to be a bit more in the business of warfare. You know, what does it mean if you if you were one of those soldiers? Are you prepared to say, okay, you know, we we can lose ten Filipino soldiers to clear every house in Marawi, which was probably what they would have had to do if they didn't drop bomb from the sky or fire in some heavy explosive weapons into the houses from the little artillery they had locally. So that, and just, just to raise alternatives, I mean, sometimes you don't have to raise them in diplomatic processes because people will happily sign bits of paper anyway and think no more about them and do nothing about them. So, but as a you know rigorous academic, you would have to pose alternatives, I think. And then I, I, I totally understand, you know, what Wanda and, you know, Abby are saying and how they really want to, you know, do what, Rasmus was saying and go to the max and try and protect every single civilian and it's very interesting you know how how war is changing um and it seems to me that you know there are two big variables in play at the moment that we haven't had before which could help you both really change war and make it quite a sanitized affair and then as I read you both eventually abolish it and one is women. So there is a regendering of war policy, of the framing of the very existence of war that you and others all represent. And there's a critical mass now of women engaged in war policy and politics. And that could really do what you want and make things, it could genuinely change what warfare is. And the other is China. Because one of you, I think it was Nick actually said, and the P5 all supporting other people and that sort of thing. But actually, you've got to say the P4 because you've got to stand by China on the fact that it is the least interventionist of the P5 powers. It doesn't tend to yet really rock up and get involved and fight and fuel and supply and whatever, you know, in quite the same way. Now, if whereas China becomes a major superpower alongside the US, which has always been intensely belligerent, and the UK, which is not a superpower, but is always very belligerent, could China really change what war is about too and make it increasingly politically unnecessary and unacceptable? 
And if that happens, that's very interesting too. Um, but so that's, that's, I mean, I see you both, I hear you both perhaps unfairly as abolitionists and hoping that you can save every civilian. And I think those are your two best bets for that in a funny way. I, you know, there's been enormous progress on civilian protection. I've been reading about World War I and comparing it with, you know, 2015, 1915. The incredible way that we save so many civilians' lives now compared to 100 years ago. Um, and whether that is a blip in history or part of a longer trend is the key question. And, you know, again, it's a terrible thing to say, but, you know, compared to before, not so many civilians die in war now. We, you know, a lot of civilians are saving, so are being saved. So maybe there is progress there, and I think it would probably hinge on women in China. Um, and then, Henrik, on cyber war, I would agree, yes, that is what we're, you know, going into. And I think we're seeing a lot of it already. So you can look at Tigray and Myanmar, and, you know, cyber interventions have been used hard and fast to switch off the internet. And there you can understand it more as siege and blockade. So, in fact, a lot of the traditional images we have of warfare technique, like blockade and siege, work in cyberspace, because that's what really you know, Addis and Yangon were doing. They were putting their countries under siege and blockade in various ways. So I think there is a lot of it about. In, in As far as I know, in the wars like Ukraine and Syria, where it's been going on, it hasn't been very well coordinated yet. So it's just been bits of cyber alongside kinetic, but it'll get really orchestrated soon. Thanks a lot. Um, we have... Uh, 10 minutes left and the discussion is now really warming up so we should have had more uh, i know radia uh, you don't have the raise hand function so i just wanted to ask you radia if you have a, a raised hand inside you no you okay so you'll have a final uh, comment to the end if you like okay so then i have uh, wanda erini Giorgo and uh, Nick Marsh, and then we will uh, uh, have a final little uh, round of uh, comments, and that's it. So please, Wanda. Thank you. I am, I am mindful that I have already commented a lot, so I will be uh, very quick in two points. Um, just uh, regarding how the declaration could be actually implemented, I am I am pretty sure that the countries that are involved in the discussion, including those in um, in military alliances, uh, are, are, are looking at this also from their military perspectives. And there's examples already of how some countries have already taken in this direction. Not, not necessarily they are calling it a void, uh, but there's a an excellent document from the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, where you have a list of military policy and practices, including tactical directives from ISAF, from AMISOM. So these examples already exist. Um, and just on the issue of cyber war, ooh, this could also um, give us for another webinar. And I'm, I'm really not specialized on that, but I just want to point out that there's a lot of uh, topics that we could link to that are not in the context of international humanitarian law, but in national, so-called national security. So we have to see all the problems that are um, happening now on facial recognition, for example, being used in Mexico against uh, feminist organizations, uh, against human rights demonstrations in the US, etc. So that, that leads into, into that. And just to say that from an international affairs point of view, I think cyber war will take um, even more and more momentum because countries in the north are also exposed and vulnerable to that, whereas they're not that exposed to explosive weapons. So I think the view is going to be also different. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Irini, uh, please introduce yourself and then... Yeah, thank you, Christopher, and thank you for inviting the ICRC to this exclusive meeting. It was indeed a very interesting discussion. For those who don't know me, my name is Irini Jorgu. I'm a legal advisor at the ICRC, and I am in charge of the explosive weapons in populated areas work of the ICRC. So I wasn't planning on taking the floor, but I was triggered to make a couple of quick points on the avoidance policy. As you know, this has been the position of the ICRC for over a decade now. And, um, and although I think Rasmus and Wanda and others uh, made a very good job at explaining what it means and what it doesn't mean, 
I just wanted to wrap up with a couple of points and I think the main thing I wanted to say was it is a false dichotomy to look at the avoidance policy as a black or white choice between either using certain weapons or not using certain weapons in populated areas. It's not about ruling out the use of certain weapons. We all agree that would be unrealistic because when we talk about explosive weapons with wide area effects, we literally mean about 80% of military arsenals of most states in the world today. What the avoidance policy is, is essentially a different mindset. So what we are calling states and their armed forces to do is to no longer start from what is currently the mindset. We can use any weapon as long as it complies with IHL, because that's a starting point, at least for most states. And it leads to the results that we have seen in cities like Mosul and uh, Sana'a and elsewhere. I, I will name all of them. Instead, we are asking them to change the starting point and to say the use of these weapons with wide area effects against most targets in populated areas has a very high risk, not only of causing civilian harm, but also of violating rules of IHL prohibition of indiscriminate attacks and prohibition of disproportionate attacks in particular. So instead of taking this, you know, is it lawful, is it not lawful? States don't always agree, interpretations differ, and in any case, as I said, in virtually most cases, states will say they use these weapons lawfully, and the results that we see are unacceptable civilian harm from a humanitarian point of view, and I would also argue in the ICRC's view, in many cases, unacceptable from a legal point of view. So because of this high risk, avoiding using these weapons means precisely looking into not only alternatives, but also all the mitigation measures that can be taken to reduce the area effects of these weapons, or otherwise the risk of civilian harm and yes, evacuations, are part of those mitigation measures, but then I would very much agree with Wanda, and that's a comment that I would also like to make. Um, witnessing the plight of displaced people, especially in prolonged displacement, I would not say that evacuation is the golden solution. Also, as I'm sure Hugo knows well, proportionality is not just about civilian casualties, it's also about destroyed civilian objects. So if you evacuate a city, of course, it's much better than bombing it with civilians inside, but all the civilian objects that will be damaged, time reconstruction will take, cost of reconstruction, and all the reverberating effects this will have on the lives of civilians down the line in time are to a large extent, if foreseeable, also included in the proportionality assessment. So that's also from a legal point of view. So avoidance means, yes, look into mitigation measures that you can take to reduce the wide area effects of weapons. And if you can, then use a mortar, use an artillery by all means. If you take other measures to reduce the risk of civilian harm, but including the reverberating effects of what happens when essential services are disrupted, then yes, use them. Is it possible? In most cases, in our view, it isn't. And I think, you know, that's the premise of the avoidance policy. Start from not using them um, instead, and then look into when you can actually sufficiently reduce the risk for civilians in order to use them. And alternatives, yes, I think it's the business of militaries to look and develop alternatives whereby they can win the war, which is their mission and their job, while protecting civilians and their own forces, of course, to the maximum extent possible. So yes, uh, it is their job to look, think about alternatives and develop them. But the point I wanted to make, and I'm sorry for taking so long, is it's not just about more and more and more precision weapons. That's not the only or the ultimate solution. It's an entire mindset that goes with an avoidance policy, and that's what we are trying to achieve also by means of the declaration. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, a lot. And uh, now, in the interest of time, I have uh, Nick there. I think we'll actually just 
turn to the round of uh, final comments from the uh, panel. That means, uh, unfortunately, Rasmus, that I won't have time to your uh, for your intervention. Uh, and Nick, that you'll have to integrate your hand into uh, your final comments. Uh, I think we'll go with the order of the of the panel. So we'll actually start with Hugo, please. Um, I'm not going to take much time, actually, because I think I've said my piece and I, I very much enjoyed listening to everyone. And um, yeah, I'll be very interested to see what happens with the, the declaration. And let's hope we don't have big war. And let's hope we can continue on this trend of having manageable, um, largely asymmetrical wars at the moment, where, where we can develop these um, mindsets and um, new policies. Thank you. OK, so um, Wanda. Thanks, Christopher, and thank you again for uh, for this invitation. It's been really uh, great to participate and listen from all of you. Uh, so th three quick points on explosive weapons. I think we um, we need to be looking at the declaration and see, particularly uh, from my view, how it could be strengthened in, in ensuring the objective is truly uh, avoidance as described uh, perfectly by Irene now, and further detailing the victim assistance commitments to address the real impact of the weapons over time. On autonomous weapons, I would encourage more of us to be involved and encourage the discussions to continue because they have been suspended at the CCW because of the pandemic. But this is not neutral. It benefits those countries that are investing probably in these weapons and that are probably against any prohibition or any regulation. And finally, just linking to an earlier comment by Raya. I would like to encourage all of us to dedicate more of our time and reflection on not, not only on, on the, the protection of civilians, but more largely about conflict uh, prevention and how we can work together towards an international system that puts at its core uh, human security and human rights, particularly with the views of those in the countries most affected by conflict. Thank you very much. Okay, Radia, please. Do you have a final word? Yeah, thank you. I've enjoyed the discussion. I know the weapons face to face, but uh, it is different for me to hear about the weapons in a different way. Um, so it's, even if even if I live in a war zone, uh, I can't still not I can still not think about the war as the as the fact and the protecting civilians as the exceptional thing. Uh, I hope this will be changed, and I again I will talk. The whole international system is designed in a way that enhances impunity more than accountability, and this is the main problem behind all the, the civilian uh, harm uh, among the wars. Uh, I hope this will change, and it, it means a lot to work. I know the war is the worst. Nothing is more crazy than a war in the world. So we don't have to be really very realistic in facing it. We have to be a little bit crazy and think out of the box. Until now, we have the international humanitarian law since many years. And until now, in this century, parties to the conflict are still committing horrible violations. And we should think why this is still continue and how to stop it. From my side, I think the key word is accountability again. And thank you for this. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Abigail. Uh, th thank you. And thanks to everyone for the, the conversation. It's been really interesting. I guess I just want to quickly say that my main, the main takeaway that I would like people to take from my remarks and from my work is that, that we shouldn't make decisions about the risks of contemporary conflict solely in Western capitals in an exclusive way that don't involve a sufficient amount of those most impacted by conflict. Not only because it risks us making fatal assumptions and bad strategy, but also it risks perpetuating a naive assumption about the true costs of war, especially when, as has been the I mean, one of the main 
draws for remote warfare is this idea that it can get around the sort of body bag syndrome of Iraq and Afghanistan. But if we look at the risks to our own troops, is there a danger that we we miss calculate the risks and don't look enough at the risks to civilians and people on the ground in the places that we intervene. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so Nick, final intervention. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, very briefly, just to disagree with Hugo about China. Um, I mean, it isn't involved in many high profile activities. You don't see Chinese jets flying around the world bombing uh, targets, um, but it's definitely involved in supporting governments that are, you know, doing many, very, very many things that we, we disagree with. Um, so frequently the weapon being fired is was made in China. Um, and finally, uh, yeah, just to agree completely with Radia, um, uh, I, I mean, I think the the best, if not the only way, is to have accountability. Um, and for that, there needs to be real negative consequences uh, for those who are making a decision uh, to, uh, you know, to commit commit violations, to to you know, kill civilians, etc. Um, and so long as the people who are making those decisions have impunity, you know, they'll carry on doing whatever they like. So thank you. OK, thanks. I think at least we got this discussion started and uh, I'm really thankful for all your interventions. Uh, I'm thankful also, Hugo, for you taking some as rather kind of unpopular positions by provoking us a bit in terms of realism, in terms of uh, the standard um, ideals and and how we think about them. And for the uh, other panelists for uh, fighting back and for really getting this discussion, uh, uh, becoming a, a proper discussion. So with that, I'm also seeing a lot of potential for elaborating more on different sorts of scenarios for the future and, and thinking of how such scenario thinking can inform current policy making and also discussions around this uh, declaration. Uh, actually, this was uh, the first in a series of uh, scenario webinars that we're organizing in the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies. So there is more to come on uh, different topics than this as well. And uh, I forgot to mention, we also had uh, representatives of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs with us in this uh, around the table. Uh, I'm very thankful for that as well and in general for all uh, the participants and all your contributions. So thank you very much and have a good day and uh, we'll be in touch also about the dissemination of this recording. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you.